And I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the story of the woman of Samaria. That is in John's Gospel, chapter 4. I'm only going to read one verse because I'm going to rely on you going back today to uh, read the full story. And um, it's in John, John's Gospel, chapter 4. And my title today is The Release of the Spirit. And the one verse I'm going to read, John's Gospel, chapter 4, and verse 14. The water that I shall give him will become in him. Would you say with me, in him? In him a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life. That's what Jesus said to this woman of Samaria. Well, I'm not reading the whole story today. I'm sure you know about it. This woman went to the well in Samaria uh, in the middle of the day, doubtless because she was a, a, a woman of a certain reputation, and she would go when not many people would be around or nobody, but Jesus was there because he had a divine appointment to meet her right where she was and to speak into her life and to give her the good news that Jesus is Messiah and he offers life to all who come to him. And the whole story revolves around Jesus asking her to give him something to drink and then a conversation, a spiritual conversation, flows out of that. In the Energized Conference, we're going to show you how to have spiritual conversations with people who don't yet know Jesus because there is a thirst in every single human being. We can see this woman was thirsty. She had gone to the physical well to take water, doubtless because she was thirsty. And even at that physical level, Jesus himself was thirsty. But she had another thirst, a deeper thirst. Her thirst was not just a physical thirst, she had a thirst in her soul. She had thir uh, soul thirst. Her soul was thirsty. Now we can conclude that because as this interaction goes on, at a certain point, Jesus asks her to go and bring her husband. And in a very honest fashion, she says, I've got no husband. And Jesus, discerning the true situation in her life through a word of knowledge, prophetically says to her, you are right, you haven't got a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. And this wasn't just exposing her for the sake of making a point or making her feel guilty. It was showing her in her own reflection that she had a thirst in her life that had never been satisfied. And she understood this because later on she went to other people and said, I want you to meet somebody who told me everything about me. That's a wonderful thing about words of knowledge that penetrate the heart and expose the heart. But it's true and accurate that this lady said, my whole life has been about those five husbands and the one now who is no longer my, not my husband. My whole life is in that. Now, she wasn't just saying that's just the tragic story of the circumstances. I've, I've got five former husbands trailing me and the man I've got now. I'm so fed up with the idea of marriage. I'm not going to marry anybody again. And the, the, what was going on here was not just the externals, but we can read deeper into this that this woman had a soul thirst. Just try and imagine not judgmentally, but sympathetically. Try and imagine, what was she looking for? Going from one relationship to the next. What was she looking for? She had a soul thirst. Could we suggest today that she was looking for love? Somebody that would love her for herself? And can you imagine the pain after relationship broke down one after the other? And not just casual relationships, but supposedly committed covenantal relationship. Broken down. The pain of that. And, and then the longing for more. And maybe this time, maybe this guy will take care of me. Maybe this guy will give me what I'm looking for. He'll give me security. He'll take care of me. He'll love me. He'll respect me. 
Now, we don't know when the relationship broke down. Maybe it was all her fault, maybe all his fault. I don't know. But I do know this. When Jesus met her, she was disappointed. She was upset. She was unfulfilled. And so much so that we could possibly say that uh, this last relationship, when it was time to pop the question, she said, no way, Jose. Not that he was a Jose, I don't know, but no way. I've been there. And I think in some ways that's a reflection of our society today. Marriage is a strong institution in our society. The trouble is, people are voting against, not marriage, but divorce. And in no way do I condone this. We've got to get back to the understanding that a relationship between a man and woman that enters depth and commitment requires the covenant of marriage for that relationship to flourish in the way that God designed. But more and more people today aren't bothered about that. They go from one relationship to the other. I'm not even talking about casual one-night stands. I'm talking about people who say, well, I'm just going to, I'm not going to rush into marriage. I'm going to wait, I'm going to have, and then this, oh, this, this doesn't work out, and then I'll try again. And in many ways, this lady is in a position of many young women today. Maybe some of you, women in their 20s, early 30s, and, 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 and they're still dissatisfied. Please, let me help you. Never put your trust in a man. Wait. I paused there because I knew... I'd get an amen, maybe the wrong kind of amen. <laughs> Let me finish now. Always put your trust in God. Because if you go into any relationship or any situation, and I'm not just talking about human relationships, male-female relationships, I'm talking about anything in your life that you trust in because you think it's going to give you that satisfaction for which your soul is thirsting, you have made it an idol. Soul thirst. But I also think she had a deeper thirst. We can call it spirit thirst. There's a book floating around in my mind. I don't know when I'm going to get down to write it. Book entitled, working title, Thirst for Spirit. We know that today, people, despite the brainwashing that goes on in our schools, despite the secular humanist spirit of our age, despite the rabid fundamentalist atheists who say there is no God, we have never been able to find the satisfaction, not just for our souls, but for the spirit that we long for. God made us body, soul, spirit. He made us spiritually. In other words, there is a, a spiritual desire in us. And, and even today, we discover that even atheists, people who say there is no God, are writing books like this. Atheist spirituality. Spirituality for atheists. They realize that their doctrine, there is no God, is not reaching people's hearts where it matters most. And the frustration for this kind of uh, idea, ideology such as atheism, is that never has it been a generation, Europe and worldwide, that is more religious than today. So you can take away God, you can even take away religion, but you cannot take away the thirst for spirit. Now, we know that this woman had a thirst for spirit because as soon as Jesus gets uncomfortably close to exposing the gap in her soul, she starts talking about religious matters. And uh, Jesus said, if you, look, if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask him and he'll give you water that will, from which you'll never thirst again. And she said, are you greater than our fathers? Greater than Jacob who gave us this well, Jacob's well, greater than that. And, and anyway, you people, you Jews say that Jerusalem's the place to worship. And uh, we can see this as a red herring. So often when you put your finger in people's lives where they feel a bit uncomfortable, they will start getting all religious on you. Start arguing religion. There's a good side and a bad side to that. The bad side is, is that they can be argumentatively religious it's just a way of saying, you have your religion, I have my religion, and all religions lead to God, and all kinds of red herrings. But actually, behind even the very mention of religion lies a thirst. People are looking for God. 
And when Jesus said to this woman, she said, you, he said, you worship what you do not know. Very, very significantly. He says, it's not about religion. It's about knowing God. And I think that today, many people who have a hunger to know God seem to have nowhere to turn uh, other than maybe their background brought up in a particular religious background and come to an age where you say, I think I better think more seriously about life. And so they go to the default religious position. And I'm not criticizing any religion today because I'm criticizing them all. I'm talking about Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. I'm even talking about the so-called Christian religion. Religion doesn't cut it. But a relationship with God does. Only knowing God through Jesus Christ can meet that deep spiritual need. That's why Jesus said the time is coming when true worshipers will worship neither in Jerusalem nor on this mountain, but worship in spirit and truth. It is not about religious observance. It's not about the rules and regulations, the methodologies and the spiritual technologies of religion. It is about coming to a heart relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And it's about knowing God sincerely in your heart. And when that happens, you find that he is beginning to satisfy that thirst within you, that deep spiritual thirst, that deep, sincere search for God will come to fulfillment when you bow the knee in sincere and genuine worship, knowing that you thirst for the waters of life and Jesus brings that satisfaction. That's why Jesus said, whoever drinks the water that I will give will never thirst again. It's very clear that Jesus intended all of those of us who love him and serve him to have a deep, satisfying experience of himself through the Spirit. I chose my words carefully, obviously. A deep, satisfying experience of God through the Spirit. A deep experience of the Spirit. I believe that's what Jesus is referring to when he says, the water that I shall give him will become a fountain of living water springing up into everlasting life. You know, as a charismatic Pentecostal church, we always like talking about being filled with the Spirit. And that's right. But being filled with the Spirit is more than experiencing God's touch upon your life. It's more profound than that. It's not just about experiencing the Spirit of God externally as something that is coming upon you from outside. Now, that does happen. We, we learn to become very sensitive to the sense of God's Spirit amongst us. And, and we don't teach against how sometimes, very often in fact, God's presence can somehow be experienced tangibly. Because God is manifesting his presence. And um, I, for one, am not astonished when people are prayed for and the power of God comes on them that sometimes they fall down. In fact, you know, for me, it's more surprising that anybody can stand in the presence of God. But you know, it's one thing to get a touch from God Ooh, and get the, whatever it is, the holy jerks and holy rolls and fall down under the power of God, and assume that just because God has touched us physically, that, that necessarily means that he has done a deep work in our hearts. I think it's up to us to say, God, you're powerfully present. Why are you giving me this anointing? Why are you allowing me to sense your presence right now? It's wonderful and joyful, but there is a purpose beyond that. It's not just about God coming upon us, but God being released in us. The purpose of his coming upon us is that he should work in us. Christianity is all about experiencing God from within. And as temples of the living God, you are already indwelt by the divine presence. I want to pause there 
Because when I thought about this, we know it's true. We've got scripture verses. We understand it. It's true. Jesus said, you, the, about the Holy Spirit, you, you know him for he is with you. But he, the Holy Spirit, shall be in you. We know that Paul wrote to the Corinthians and says, you are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the house of God. There is a holy place within you, a sanctuary that God designed from the very beginning to be empty without him and only he can fill it. And we, we know this, but I still think we need to pause for a moment and just say how amazing, how amazing that right now God in all his glory and power and divinity and majesty and authority, the God of the universe dwells in you. And we say, well, what else do we need? If God is in us, then all the resources for life and living, for Holy Spirit activity, for serving God, for showing him to the world, everything has already been placed within us. The power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the purity of the Holy Spirit. Christianity is all, as I said, about God in you. But unless you understand this, unless you have a deep and personal experience of its reality that you know as you know as you know that God is at work within you, that God's presence dwells within you, it's not about going to Jerusalem or to Samaria, or any other place in order to find God. God lives with you. He has set up home in you. Amen. Amen. Until you know that, you will never discover how to let the Holy Spirit do a real deep work in your life. And anyway, you will miss it many times when the Holy Spirit starts moving and you sense the anointing and you experience that. You'll miss its purpose. Some time ago, I had a very extraordinary experience, sense of this. And it's slightly negative, it's slightly against myself, but I'm sure you'll understand. It's an occasion once when we had one of our big celebration meetings together at a guest speaker and the Holy Spirit was flowing in power and he brought everybody on to minister at the end. And, and um, I was astonished, please don't misunderstand me, I'll try and explain this how easy it was to hook on to what the Holy Spirit was doing and minister to other people. The power of God, the words of knowledge flowing, the healings, everything was wonderful. But what nobody knew, not even myself until I reflected on it, was how dry and empty I was inside. None of it, at that point, touched my own heart. Now, I'm slightly embarrassed to, to admit that, but sometimes it's so much easier just to flow with the gifts, but really, how about seeking God for myself? And I, and I, I was a bit troubled by that. I felt like a man who was desperately thirsty, walking out into the rain, being saturated and soaked on the outside, but still dry on the inside. And so for all of us, we need to understand that when God moves upon us, it's that he might move in us. And we have to allow him full reign from the inside and, and to begin to drink for ourselves, not just to be carried on by the tide of what's happening around us, but to say, God, I'm desperate for you on the inside. And anyway, if we don't think like that, all these experiences, no matter how amazing they, can, they are, and, and the, the, the phenomena can be quite spectacular. Uh, people can fall down under the power of God and, and have all kinds of, of physical and emotional reactions and effects of the Spirit of God upon them, but at the end of the day, remain exactly the same inside. And so we need to understand that when God moves in power, it's, it's, he doesn't want it to be a superficial experience or a transitory experience no matter how powerful and real it is at the time, unless we allow God to move deep within us, then we will remain the same. And once you know that, you can begin to learn the secret of drawing on his presence within you. You can begin to experience the release of the Spirit of God in your life because 
you have a well within you that is full of the Holy Spirit waiting to bubble up and to burst forth. One picture is I'm going to draw water from the well of salvation. So you've got a, a bucket and a very long rope and you throw it in and you wait and you wait and you wait and wait and wait. After half an hour, you hear a little splash. Whoa, that's so deep. And you have to draw it up and draw it up. Like it, it sort of takes forever. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying the, the well within you is alive. It's like a perrier bottle of ga- gaseous water that has been shaken and shaken and shaken and shaken so much so that the cork is about to explode. And, it, and when you take it off, it goes everywhere. Some of our members of staff play that joke on me every Sunday. They buy some sparkling water, shake it up, and put it in front of me so that when I open it, it goes everywhere. (laughs) Friends, what's in you can't wait to get out. There's an upward thrust. This spring of living water is bubbling up it's, it's wanting to come out. And in fact, the, if it doesn't, it's because we're blocking. That's the only thing. It's not because God doesn't want to. Somehow, there's a blockage. We've got to find out about that, what that blockage is. Wonderful thing about this spring that's in us is there's nothing we can ever do to get it. It's a gift. If you knew who I was, you said you'd ask me, and I will give you something to drink. It's a gift. It's present in every, every single one of us. And this, this living water deep in, within us is, is seeking to bubble up. It's something good that's happening. Isn't that wonderful? I thank God for this message. Because very often, uh, it's easy to stand in the pulpit and say, hmm, there's something wrong with you and you. Have you heard preaching like that? Stop it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you take the lid off and you see what's happening beneath the surface, there's a lot of stinking flesh. Yeah. We accept that. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the bottom line. In fact, that's not the most true thing about you. The truest thing about you is that deep down in your spirit, deep down in your heart, God is living. A miracle is taking place. Supernatural life rests at the core of your being because you've been recreated by Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. And that's a gift. A gift. The gift of the spirit in your life as a believer The presence and power of the Holy Spirit waiting to burst out in life-giving, life-transforming, life-satisfying freshness. Hallelujah. This is supernatural. It's there for every one of us. So you say, what's the problem? Well, I hinted at it earlier. There's a cork in the bottle. Can this flow be blocked? So we move from Perrier. Let's take Champagne. Because that picture is very, very familiar to you, I know, when you watch the Formula One racing. No other way. I know you have no other experience of this than that. What do they do? That cork is on there, yeah? All the bubbles are inside. You take the cork out and everything explodes and you shake it up. And you... So you see, it, ca- it is possible to block the flow. And therefore, the answer to the release of the Spirit is to go deep enough so that that blockage is released. So what blocks the flow? Oh, now we have all kinds of things. I'm just going to mention two. But this goes on and on. Somebody, anybody, everybody will say, ah, there's a problem here, and I know what it is. Disobedience, that's the problem. It's never disobedience, it's disobedience. Uh, Why, you see, unless you walk in obedience, the Spirit's flow is blocked. Okay, I wouldn't want to argue with that. The only problem is, is that we need the Spirit of God in order to do anything good. 
Righteousness is not the natural state of the human heart apart from the grace of God. So it's all very well to say, ah, there's disobedience in your life. There's sin in your life. Well, what's the solution? Try harder. First of all, put your life right, and then God will release his spirit. There'd be no hope for any of us if God had to wait for us to put things right before he moved in our lives. Everything we do, every desire to walk God's way, every power that we need to take a step forward in the path of righteousness comes by the Spirit of God. We need the release of the Spirit even before we can do anything good. We, start, we simply can't do it alone. Others would say, oh, yes, 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 but you need repentance. You need to repent. You need a change of heart before God will work in your life again. It's the wrong way around. Walking in repentance and faith and obedience is an absolute must for any believer. I'm not denying that. But we need the Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit, we can't turn from our sin. We can't put one foot in front of the other without the grace of God and the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't trust God for anything without the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit. The natural state of our hearts is self-reliance, not God-reliance. Still others say, oh, oh, I know, I know. You need to pray more. You need to give more. Read the Bible more. You need to fast more. And everything you need to do, you need to do more, 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 until you say, enough already. What else do I have to do to get God to bless me? You know, that's old covenant living, friends. Not new covenant living. New covenant living is about the gift of life in the Holy Spirit. And in the strength and energy and blessing of that life, we turn to God. Recently, we're looking at Psalm 51. Even David didn't even begin to praise God until God helped him. He said, open my mouth and then I will praise you. Surely you say, open your own mouth, mate. You praise God. Here's some words. Say this. I love God. Say it. I love God. You're praising him. No, no. David knew that to praise God and worship God sincerely, just as Jesus says here, worshiping in spirit and truth, can only come by the Holy Spirit. Anything that we offer to God, which is meaningful and right and refreshing and life-giving, we owe to the Holy Spirit in the new covenant. Of course, all these things that I said have their place. Yes, they do. God wants us to walk in the Spirit. God wants us to walk in obedience. God wants us to walk in repentance and faith and so on. They have their place, but they're not the key to the release of the Spirit in your life. The crucial thing to remember is if you want to experience more of God, You've got to go deeper. The deeper you go with God, the more the Spirit of God is released in your life. How do you go deeper? It's a big question. You know, lots of ways. But at the heart of it is this. Is abandoning the old way of living according to the written code and abandoning yourself to the Holy Spirit. Your problem is, is that you've abandoned yourself to the wrong thing. Let me give you a verse for this so I can explain it. Romans 7 verse 6. Apostle Paul has this statement in a chapter in which he's dealing with how we overcome the flesh by being set free from the law. Many people think that you overcome the flesh by trying to be more obedient, finding out what rules you've broken and keep them, finding out what you failed to do and doing it. No, 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 no. That's a sure way of remaining in bondage to the flesh because the law can only tell you what to do. It cannot give you the power to do it. And and Paul says, you know, you, you need to know something. In Christ, you died to the law that you might be married to somebody else that this person who is Christ will enable you to bring fruit for God. Now, this is what he says, Romans 7, verse 6. But now 
dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law. This word released is very strong. It means delivered, set free. The law held us in bondage because the law was weak because of our flesh. But Jesus has completely bypassed all of that and given us the gift of his spirit, a changed heart. The rest of the verse goes on, having been released from the law so that we may serve God in the new way of the spirit, not in the old way of the written code. And again, some people may say, well, I don't understand this law of Moses. Never understood that. In fact, the worst book in the Bible is the book of Leviticus. Leviticus. I don't want anything to do with it. Well, it's everything to do with you because the flesh is naturally legalistic. Let me explain it. The old way is like this. I have got to please God by my own efforts. I've got to earn my place in his favor. I've got to do things in such a way as he notices me that I can qualify for his blessing. And here it is. We have made in our minds an agreement with God. That's what the flesh does. In fact, God has never made that agreement. He's not agreed to it at all. We may have signed it, but his signature is absent. It's not what he is doing. But this is how we think. All right, uh, here's the deal. God, if I do A, then you will give me B. So we spend all our time doing the A's so that God will give us the B's. B you, normally stands for blessing. Blessing. Uh, and when we look at the B, we say, what B do I want? Okay, that's what I want. Now, what do I have to do to get it? And, and many of the charismatic and even non-charismatic bookshops are filled with all kinds of bad teaching telling you what the A's are in order to get the B's you want. Seven steps to five ways of three methods of getting this. And in fact, God says, I have not signed that deal. And when things go wrong, we say, God, you, you haven't done your, I've, I've tithed. I've tithed ever since I was earning money. And I'm still as, Wretched as I was before. I've confessed every healing promise in the book and a whole number that are not even in the book. I have confessed it all. God, what's gone wrong? You have not done your part. And God said, I never agreed to that arrangement. I tell you what I've, I've agreed to. I've taken all my blessings and all my promises. I've put them in the package of Christ and a DHL delivery came to your life the moment you got saved. That's God's deal. All God's promises are in him. And it's so easy to be blessed by God. God's blessings are so freely given, so fully paid for in Christ, so available by God's delivery system, that even if it appears that God appears to be withholding even one tiny blessing, we know that God withholds no good thing from those who love him, the trouble is his timing isn't always our timing. But even if it appears that God is not listening and God is not answering and God is not blessing you, even just a tiny, tiny part of a blessing, you can rejoice. <gasps> rejoice? Why? Because it's so easy for God to bless you that if he is in any way appearing to withhold anything, he is always to up to something. <laughs> up to something fantastic, up to something more glorious, more wonderful than if he gave you an instant answer to your prayer. That's trusting God. That's the new way of the Holy Spirit because only by the Holy Spirit can you be carried along in your love and worship and devotion and God becomes the first thing in your life and all these other things as important as they are, they're not worth comparing with him. Even the blessings are not worth comparing with the one who blesses, let alone the sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. That's the life of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit core draws us into a deep thirst quenching, spirit thirst 
quenching relationship. And we find in the Holy Spirit the very passion that was in Christ and the power that flows from Him coming into this new nature of ours. And the passion for Christ by the Holy Spirit is so supernatural that that passion can become so positive, so strong, so dominant that it pushes out all other passions. The expulsive power of a superior passion. One modern writer describes it as that. Hallelujah. And when Christ is so central in your life and his life is so exploding within you, all you experience is the goodness of God and you're able to trust him with everything. It means also that you can lay aside this immature attitude, the baby attitude of demanding things. Gimme, 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 God. Now, you can learn to trust him in his goodness even though things don't appear to be working out and you'll be far less dependent on running here, there, everywhere, including nowhere to get somebody to pray for you that you might be blessed. Whole conventions and, uh, and conferences are built on this notion, come and be blessed. Fine, good, but how? Because there is a whole man of God who has more anointing his little finger than you'll ever have in all of your life. Nonsense! You are anointed. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Don't misunderstand me. It's wonderful to receive prayer from one another. It's wonderful to receive prayer from those who are sensitive to the Holy Spirit and have a history of God using them to bless and minister to others. It's wonderful. Every Sunday night, when we have more time than we do in the earlier services, you can be prayed for to your heart's content. Wonderful. That's important. But it's not because you don't have it. It's not because you don't have what it takes. It's not because God is absent from your life and you need somebody holier than thou in order to make it happen. No, no, no. You need to draw water from your own well. You need to know that God has put within you everything that it takes to be satisfied with Christ and to live for him in a way that glorifies him. Hallelujah and hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And even when it comes, I'm going to ask the musicians to come and join me now because we're going to go out with worship today. Even when it comes to looking at the things that we need. Okay, let me just give you a word of knowledge now. I'm playing now. I sense by the Spirit there's somebody here with a need. Is anybody here with a need? <laughs> But I tell you something, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 32, God knows that every one of us has a need. Yes. Our needs come in packages of dozens. Yes. But God says through Jesus, after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows, Daddy knows that you have a need. He knows you need all these things. And if daddy knows, you can trust him. Yeah. Some say, well, if he knows, why, why bother praying? And sometimes I, I wonder why God doesn't interrupt us more. He must be very patient. Daddy, I need. Yeah, and he said, I know. I know. Well, if you know, why do I have to ask you? you you're not asking me to inform me. You're asking me because it's good for you to look to me and be specific with your request. And if your heavenly father knows you need all things, he's your father. Is he going to withhold? Is he going to pull back? Is he going to mock you in your need? No, of course, he's going to be there for you. And, and this is such a sure promise of God that if at any moment it looks different, trust him anyway. Amen. Trust him anyway. Only the life of the Holy Spirit can do this. That's how the Holy Spirit's released. When you trust in God and believe God, the Holy Spirit will flow. Because it's not about you trying to please God, trying to match up to God, trying to get things from God. It's I am living in this wonderful river of life. And I am satisfying the thirst of my spirit 
longing only for you, finding satisfaction in you. And the biggest prayer is, oh, yes, God, bless my family. Oh, yes, God, give me a pay rise. Oh, yes, God, give me this thing. But you know what? Do you know what I want? I want you more than anything else. That's the Holy Spirit released within you. The more you try to get close to God in your own strength, the more defeated, desperate you become. But the more you abandon yourself to the energy of the flow of the Holy Spirit who is already at work in you, the more you are carried along in his life-giving presence into the real satisfaction of thirsting after the living God and drinking at the fountain of life. And the more of his power you will experience, more of his presence you will experience. This is one of the most significant principles of the spiritual life, and we're not going to do any more about it today other than go to it. We're going to experience this. We're going to worship God. We've got a few minutes left. And in this time, you've been worshiping wonderfully today. I was watching and flowing with you. It's wonderful. But there's a, there is a depth of worship that we're going to touch today that we haven't touched in the earlier part of the service yet. Because out of this revelation that there is this divine presence working within, wanting to manifest within your life to, to give you, first of all, the first opportunity to drink and satisfy your thirst and, and beyond that to begin to give to others to drink out of your own life and experience with Christ. The richness, the joy, the flow of the Holy Spirit. Wherever you are, it's not about whether you deserve it. None of us deserves it. Even you who have double tithed this morning and got two hours of quiet time in every morning before work and this morning you got up an hour extra early on top of the hour that you had and gave two hours for God. You are no more, no less qualified than the people who rolled out of bed and yawned their way into the church this morning. Because... The gift of God is within you. Let's focus on him. Let's stand and worship. Let's bless his holy name right now. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you.